when the Buddha first started teaching after his awakening. The first thing he talked about was the problem of suffering or stress and how to put an end to it. And the explanations he gave are called right view. In other words, a view that you hold in mind because it is effective. It helps direct you as to what to do when you find yourself faced with suffering. And the fact that he made this his first topic, and as he stated many times throughout his career, that everything else that he explained was simply a working out of his first discussion, shows that this problem is not just one out of many problems, it is the problem that he wanted to address. It's interesting that all the things he learned in his awakening, all that he saw when the time came to teach, didn't talk that much about it. As he said, the teachings on suffering were like a handful of leaves, and what he had learned in his awakening was like a whole forest of leaves. So an important part of adopting right view is not only learning to look at your experience in terms of the Four Noble Truths, but also realizing that this is the important problem takes precedence over everything else. That may sound selfish, you know, focusing on your own suffering, but you look at the people in the world, and the fact that we're making one another suffer so much is because we ourselves don't understand suffering. If we knew how to take care of our own suffering, we wouldn't be a burden on others. So it's not a selfish issue. In fact, all the problems of the world would be cleaned up if everyone could take care of their own suffering. We can't wait for the whole world to get cleaned up this way. But we can start cleaning up our own corner, the area where we are responsible. You notice the Buddha didn't go around saving other beings, but he did teach them how to solve their own problems. And so that's the framework we're trying to bring here. What is suffering? The Buddha gave a few instances. He talked about the suffering of birth and aging, illness, death, separation from what you love, being t together with what you don't love, not getting what you want. All that's relatively familiar. But then when he summarized the problem of suffering, he started talking in terms that were not familiar. He said the five clinging aggregates. Aggregates here in the sense of the pile of things from which we take bits and pieces and cobble together our sense of who we are. The fact that we cling to these things, that's why we suffer. The aggregates on their own are not suffering. They arise and pass away, and to that extent there is a certain amount of stress just in the arising and passing away. But the part that places a burden on the mind is not the aggregates, it's the clinging. The aggregates are basically activities. There's the fact that you've got a body, that's one of the aggregates, and then you've got feeling and perception. Feeling is feeling tone, like pleasure and pain, or neutral feelings of neither pleasure nor pain. Perceptions are the labels you place on things, saying this is this and that is that. And there's fabrication, the way the mind puts together ideas out of its perceptions, comments on things, asks questions about things, gives answers. And there's consciousness, which is aware of all these things. These are the basic functions by which we identify ourselves. These are the functions we use in order to feed in the world. And the word clinging has a connection to the world word for feeding as well. So it's basically how we go around feeding. We have a feeling, say, of hunger, and so we go out and see what can we identify as the thing we want to feed on that will assuage that hunger. And then we figure out how to get it. They've got feeling, perception, and fabrication right there. 
We're engaging in this all the time, not only in physical hunger, but also in terms of mental hunger, emotional hunger. It's how we feed that we suffer. That's pretty radical. Because for most of us, the way we feed is how we find pleasure. How we define ourselves. And John Lee has a nice passage where he talks about being able to speak with animals, understand their language, and have visions in his meditation where animals would come, and animals around the area where he was. And the questions he would talk about, he found that you could talk with animals, was how have you been feeding? What did you get to eat today? In the canon, the, the Buddha talks about remembering past lives, and when the main memory is your pleasure and your pain and what you got to eat in that particular life. It looms large in our lives, and, yet the, and we define ourselves around that. And that's the problem. So the Buddha is not, however, recommending that we starve ourselves. He does say, though, to look at what is the cause of this need to feed. There's the craving that keeps making us take on an identity. And that's to be abandoned. And the suffering itself is to be comprehended. In other words, you learn to watch it and look at it, understand it. Now you're going to look at suffering. Most of us want to run away from it. This is what the path is for. In particular, there's right concentration. The right in the path, or all the factors are right, because they're right in that they work. The analogy the Buddha gives is of trying to get oil. There's a right way and there's a wrong way. If you try to squeeze oil out of gravel, you're not going to get it. You squeeze oil out of sesame seeds, you'll get oil. And it's the same way if you practice adopting right views and practicing right concentration and all the other right factors of the path, you get the results. So these things are right, not because the Buddha said they were, but because they actually work. And right concentration is our food. It too is made out of those aggregates. You've got the form of the body sitting here. The breath is also count, counted as form. You know, the feelings of ease or dis-ease that come with the breath your perceptions of how you think of the breath to yourself. What image do you hold in mind when you breathe in? Where do you feel the breath? What do you think is happening when you breathe in? Some people think of the body as a big bellows. When you tell them to allow the breath energy to go to different parts of the body, they think they're going to squeeze the breath energy in, because that creates problems. You would hold a different image in mind. The body is like a big sponge. You breathe in, the breath energy is coming from everywhere, through all the pores of the skin. It's already flowing in some parts of the body, and it's simply a matter of allowing it to flow through the ones where it's blocked. Those are some of the perceptions you can use to help get the mind more concentrated. Then there's fabrication, the questions you ask about the breath. Is the breath comfortable? Could it be more comfortable? How about this? How about that? You try things, you experiment. If you get good results, then you can start spreading that sense of ease around the body. All this comes under fabrication. And then there's your awareness of all this, which sometimes is focused with these activities, sometimes slips back to other things. But when you learn how to keep, keep at it, get all these things working together, You've got food for the mind. There's going to be a sense of well-being that comes simply breathing. Someone once said, what is this about Buddhism? They say, you go sit under a tree and you breathe? Well, yes. You learn what it is to have breath energy in the body. You learn how you can nourish your, your mind, you can nourish your body by the way you breathe. It's like free medicine that's available to us that most of us ignore free food, just that it takes time to learn how to fix this food. So that instead of feeding off your aggregates in ways that are going to cause suffering, you learn how to turn those aggregates into a path. One image you can hold in mind is 
when you're carrying the aggregates around, it's like bricks that you put in a big bag, a big sack over your shoulder. When you start practicing, you take those bricks and you put them down on the ground and they become a path that you can follow. Your relationship to them is different. You're still feeding, but you're feeding in a different way. You're feeding more skillfully. And it's this feeding off the right concentration that gives you the strength to go back and look at your suffering, to step back from it and say, oh, been identifying myself with this way of feeding off the world or that way of feeding off the world, and you can see that it's not worth it. You've got something better. You can make comparisons. And as you do that, you drop a lot of your old ways of feeding, and you find that you're also dropping a lot of your old ways of suffering. Until the mind gets strong enough through the path, and you can get enough insight into what's going on in the mind, that you reach something in the mind that doesn't need to feed. It's an awareness that's totally free of conditions. And that's when you realize that the Buddha's strategy as a teacher was extremely intelligent. And not just intelligent, very compassionate. He focused on the problem that all of us had. Here was the most awakened being there's ever been in this aeon. And he wanted us to learn how not to suffer. He wanted to teach us how we can develop the skills not to suffer. That's an extreme act of compassion. Someone's, someone once called the Buddhist path the path of the intelligent heart. Intelligent in the sense that it's really wise. And there's heart there as well. It's not just figuring things out, but it's figuring out the problem that weighs most heavily on the human heart. So as we sit here and meditate, try to keep these thoughts in mind and keep the priorities that the Buddha had in mind and make them our own priorities so that we can benefit from his teachings. That the way you feed is important, and you want to learn how to feed a lot more skillfully. And here's the breath to feed on. And it's available all day long. It's so easy when you leave the monastery to forget about this. It's even easy while you're here at the monastery to forget about it. You start getting involved in other people's dramas. You start feeding on... It's hard to describe what kind of food it is. You've got a lot better food right in here. You can let the dramas go past. Once you learn how to feed wisely and with compassion, and what the Buddha pointed out was a totally blameless way. You're lighter inside, and you also are less of a burden on the world outside you. The benefits of the practice spread around. They don't just stop with your skin. But you want to keep your awareness here in your skin, inside the body net right now. So you can, really can develop these skills. And try to keep these priorities in mind. This is where your first level of attention should be. This should be the foundation from which you do all your other things. This awareness of the breath energy here in the body, because you're coming from strength when you do this. And it leads to greater and greater strength, until, as I said, you reach a point where you find something in the mind. It's a dimension there that doesn't need to feed at all. That's totally blameless, totally pure, totally compassionate all around.